Please welcome to the stage Andrew J. Nussbaum, class of 1985, chair of the Amherst College Board of Trustees. Good, good, good afternoon, and I know I'm not the reason you're here. Um, I am a proud member of the class of 1985 and even more proud to be chairman of, of, of the Amherst College Board of Trustees. But most importantly for today, I'm a former law clerk to our guest of honor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. I, um, I've not before been in a situation where I'm being asked to introduce uh, two of my bosses, one, one former and one, one current. So I'm going to be very careful, and I'm going to be extraordinarily brief. Um, and there would be little point anyway in trying to introduce to you uh, Justice Ginsburg. You almost certainly know quite a bit about her. You may have seen the biopics that we were airing on campus over the past couple of weekends, or you've read one of the many books about Justice Ginsburg, or seen her portrayed on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Maybe you saw her perform as a supernumerary in the opera Scalia Ginsburg at the Kennedy Center. Some of you might follow her workout routine, as reported in the illustrated RBG workout book. You may also have seen the recent play, Sisters-in-Law, about the relationship between Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg. Or maybe you've read some of her opinions or many, many articles over the years. And the super ambitious of you may even know that she once wrote the most important scholarly works about Swedish civil procedure. Surely you know, I hope, that she is an honored member of the Amherst College class of 1991. I hope that you are as proud of her as I am. I would say that the 1991 mark is particularly noteworthy because I like to think that Amherst College discovered her long before President Clinton did. So I'm not going to tell you who she is and who she was. I thought instead I'd give you just a very quick view of what it was like to work for Justice Ginsburg as a law clerk. It was, in short, a dream job. It was four years of Amherst College rolled into one. It was the liberal arts education put to the true test. You had to be willing to learn a lot about many different things and to recognize right away your total ignorance at the task before you. From constitutional law to administrative law, tax law, intellectual property, the rate setting obligations of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, civil procedure, criminal procedure, and so much more. You needed to learn to dissect the arguments from litigants with whom you thought you agreed, only to discover after deep work that they actually were incorrect. You needed not to assume the answers, but to test them and to work at them, not to guess the facts, but to verify them, and not to give in to rhetoric in favor of reason. Justice Ginsburg, like a great Amherst professor, taught us how to write, clearly, succinctly, crisply, and I will say that no amount of editing from even the most ruthless Amherst professor prepared me for the utter rewrites of my draft opinions for the justice. <laughs> Fortunately, she did not grade us. Many of the teachings were quite unexpected and happened outside the walls of our chambers. During that year, I learned how to make the most amazing brownies. It's not what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> these, brownies, these brownies were a secret recipe of Marty Ginsburg the justice's beloved husband, and the chef in their family. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is many things, he would say to us, but a cook is not one of them. <laughs> I'm reminded today of another great Amherst citizen whose words were always carefully chosen and often deeply affecting, Emily Dickinson. On returning from a visit with her in August 1870, Thomas Wentworth Higginson wrote down some of her most memorable expressions, including this one. Truth is such a rare thing, it is delightful to tell it. I think you will all delight in the truth Justice Ginsburg has to tell us, and also in how she tells it. May I ask you please to give a very warm welcome to Justice Ginsburg and our President Biddy Mark.
wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you. I loved it. And short. <laughs> Please, everyone, be seated. Be seated, please. Be seated so we can start the conversation. Justice Ginsburg, it's such an honor to have you here and a privilege to have this chance to ask you questions. But before I begin, we have a surprise for you. Where is our chorus? Where is the Choral Society? Here you are. Please, a treat for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That Thank chorus you. is from my very favorite opera, The Marriage of Figaro. Mm. Our director, Ariana Bella, thank you so much, and the Choral Society, that was so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Judge Ginsburg, as I told you, I've been studying. Uh, I haven't had as much fun in a long time as I've had reading in your words, uh, reading some of the cases, uh, opinions you've written, and your dissents. But I wanted to start, because you're so well known for loving opera and music, just by asking you, what, what is the experience, what are, what are the feelings it evokes in you that have made music and opera so important to you over the course of your life, really? I became hooked on opera at age 11. And I like to tell the story of how. The year was 1944. There was a musician, a man named Dean Dixon, whose mission was to turn children on to beautiful music. So he had 
and all city symphony orchestra. He would take operas around to different high schools. He would abbreviate them to one hour with bare staging costumes. And I was just blown away by the magnificence of the music, the high drama. <laughs> this man, Dean Dixon, left the United States in 1948. He said in all the years he'd been conducting, no one ever called him maestro. And that was because he was African American. Although he had a Juilliard degree and was just like other conductors except for his race. So he went to Europe where he was the darling of everyone and had a successful career. Came back to the United States in the late 60s when every major symphony orchestra in the country wanted to engage Dean Dixon as a guest conductor. Mm. So he's kind of the Jackie Robinson of conducting. Mm. And that difference in the 20 years from his experience in the 40s to the 60s shows significant progress in, in the United States mm. in recognizing the talent of all of our people, not just some of them. So then I started going to opera rehearsals at the city center in New York, the New York City Opera, and eventually graduated to the Met. <laughs> it, there, sometimes I'm just consumed by my work and I'm thinking about it, these legal puzzles all the time. But when I go to the opera, all the briefs and opinions are put on a high shelf, and I just enjoy the glorious music. You and I both had some years at Cornell University. You got your undergraduate degree there. Uh, many of you will know that. I wanted to first tell you again how extraordinary I find your use of language, as do most people who read it, probably everyone. And you have said that you learned to write from Vladimir Nabokov. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to highlight this evening, as I often do, students will tell you I do, the importance of writing and the impact it can have on any career, really, but in particular, the impact it's had on your career. Nabokov was a marvelous teacher. He was a man in love with the sound of words. I remember the first day in his class, he read the opening pages of Bleak House mm -hmm. to us. And every now and then, he'd have a quiz. One quiz was on Bleak House, and the question was, when we first meet the character Pee Pee, what is his situation? And he, Nabokov said, almost all of you remember that Pee-Pee's head was sticking through a grate, a symbol of the misery of impoverished childhood. But only seat number whatever, which happened to be my later <laughs> husband's, not mine, my husband's, he said, Pee-Pee's large head is sticking through a grate. The addition of the word large intensifies Hmm. the image. Or he would explain why he, uh, having, I think his first language was French, then Russian, then English, why he preferred writing in English. As he said, let's take the white horse. If you are speaking French, you'll say, le cheval blanc. But you see, you'll see cheval will be brown, and then you have to adjust it to make it white. 
but in English the adjective comes first, so it's so you you never see the horse as brown. You see it as white from from the beginning. Now I was very fortunate to have uh, Bokov in modern European literature, and also the government department at uh, yeah. Cornell at that time had Clint Rossiter teaching the American presidency, mm -hmm. Robert E. Cushman teaching constitutional law, um, Mario Arnaudi teaching mm -hmm. comparative mm -hmm. law, and Milton Convitz teaching American ideals, so mm. it's a, gr a great faculty. So you got a good education. Well, yes, yes. But there were some things not right about Cornell in those days. One of them was the four to one ratio. There were four men to every woman, which made it a favorite place to send daughters. Because if you couldn't find your man at Cornell, you were hopeless. <laughs> But it also meant that the women tended to be smarter than the men. Back then, too? Yeah. <laughs> the, the excuse that was given for the ratio was that the women had to live in dormitories. The men could live off campus in College Town or in Ithaca. Years later, I get to the Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School didn't admit women until 1950, 51 was the first year, and I get there in 56. No room in the dormitory for women. Dormitories are reserved for men, and the women have to find a place in town. Just neither one made it. A little Anything. bit arbitrary, as, yes. a, as a rule. You, um, you grew up during the war and uh, the Holocaust, and you've talked about your sense of justice having been part of you from a very early age. You also came of age during the McCarthy period. Yeah. I wonder whether you could reflect a little bit on either of those periods, but I'm especially interested in how you think of the complexities of freedom of expression when you think about the McCarthy era compared to what we face today? Well, I was at Cornell in, at the heyday of Senator Joe McCarthy. Uh, he was a man who saw a communist in every corner people who had belonged to some socialist youth group in the 30s at the height of the Depression were being hauled before the House on american Activities Committee or the counterpart committees in the Senate and being quizzed about their youthful affiliations. There was one much-loved professor at Cornell. He taught zoology. He was taken out of the classroom. Singer was his name. My constitutional law professor wanted me to see that there was something very wrong with what was going on, that we were straying from our most basic values. That is, we have the right to think, speak, and write as we believe and not as Big Brother government tells us is the right way to think, speak, and write. Professor Cushman pointed out to me that lawyers were standing up for these people, reminding our Congress that we have a First Amendment protecting freedom of expression a Fifth Amendment protecting us against self-incrimination. So I got the idea that being a lawyer was a pretty nifty thing to do. Because <laughs> I thought you could get a paying job 
but at the same time do something that would make things a little better in your local communities. Little did I know that in those pre-Title VII days, Title VII is our principal anti-discrimination in employment law, in the days when there was no restriction on discrimination in employment, uh, employers felt very comfortable putting up sign-up sheets that said, men only. So, well, the changes I've seen in my long life make me optimistic for the future and especially optimistic about the people in this room and what you will do to repair tears, divisions in our society. The people in this room give me hope too. That's what's wonderful about having this job. And freedom of speech today Do you see it as being under threat or, or not? Do I think it's under threat? Mm -hmm. So far, I think we've done pretty well in preserving freedom of expression. I think part of the reason is the experience in the days of McCarthy. It's an important history lesson for those who didn't live through it, um, certainly. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about um, the tributes that you've written and delivered as talks to what you've called, I think, trailblazers, women who came before, yeah. way before um, the 20th century uh, or the second half of the 20th century and really paved the way for the kinds of work you've done. I loved reading some of them, and I wonder if you have a favorite tribute. Well, we can start with Abigail Adams, whose advice was ignored by our second president. But one person who is very important in my own thinking was named Polly Murray. Polly was from North Carolina. There's a wonderful book about her called The Firebrand and the First Lady. The Firebrand is Polly. The First Lady is Eleanor Roosevelt. And Polly had written a very strongly worded letter to then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying, in effect, how dare you speak at the University of North Carolina? That school won't admit me to its graduate program simply because of the color of my skin. Somehow that letter found its way to Eleanor Roosevelt and those two struck up a friendship that lasted while both were alive. In the 1960s, Pauli Murray wrote an article called Jane Crow and the Law. Everybody knew about Jim Crow, but in this article, Pauli pointed out all the artificial barriers that women face simply because they were women. And that, that idea, Jane Crow, uh, it was kind of my marching orders for the next 10 years to get rid of Jane Crow laws. Polly was a woman way ahead of her time. She went to Howard Law School in D.C. When she came there in the middle 40s, 
most of the lunch places didn't admit African Americans. So Pauli organized Howard students to sit in at those lunch places in the middle 40s and desegregated all of the places where the students ate lunch. This is long before the sit-ins of the 60s. She had gone to Hunter College undergraduate in, in New York and was taking one of her friends, a white friend, uh, back to visit her family in North Carolina. And when the bus crossed the Mason-Dixon line, Polly was told to go to the back of the bus. She refused. She was arrested again in the 40s, long before we knew about Rosa Parks in the 60s. So she was a, a remarkable woman. She got a, a law doctorate from Yale, but at the end of her life, this was a woman who was passionate about her religion. She decided that she would like to have the last chapter of her life as an Episcopal minister. So she probably was among the very first group of women who were ordained uh, by the Episcopal Church. She was on the ACLU's Equality Committee and one was, was one of the main people urging the ACLU not to limit itself to the First Amendment, but also to help implement the Equal Protection Clause that says, nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. So she is at last being recognized for the trailblazer that, that she was. And I consider it my great good fortune to have had a, a close relationship with her. It's, you're so generous in the tributes that you obviously research and then present and are now published. Um, and thank you for sharing that one. Speaking of the Mason-Dixon line, I wonder if I could ask you about a specific case and have you talk about one that's, you, you've actually said it was the culmination of the many cases that you brought forward, and that is the VMI case. Mm -hmm. There are many things about it that I appreciate, partly because I grew up near there in Virginia, <laughs> but I, the opinion itself and then uh, Justice Scalia's dissent are extremely interesting, but I wonder if you would mind saying a little bit about the case so everybody knows what I'm talking about and explaining why it was so significant. The, the title of the case is United States Against Virginia. It was the federal government suing the state of Virginia for maintaining an educational opportunity for men that was not available to women. Um, Justice Scalia ended up as the sole dissenter. He predicted that the decision would spell the end of VMI as its alums knew and loved it. He turned out to be quite wrong in that prophecy because VMI is flourishing today. They are very proud of their women cadets. I went back for the 21st anniversary of the decision and the place, has, has no question it's changed for the better, is still um, a very rigorous program. They still have the so-called rat line. 
and the quarters of Spartan is an understatement. But the women who come to VMI want to be engineers. One of them said she wanted to be a nuclear scientist. They have been outstanding students. There are women on the faculty. There's a woman on the board of trustees. It is a better place. Oh, the faculty was most enthusiastic about admitting women because it meant they could upgrade their applicant pool. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and to Justice Scalia's credit, I, I should tell the audience that um, although we, we were on different sides of that case, he came to my chambers one day and he threw down a sheaf of paper. And he said, Ruth, this is the penultimate draft of my VMI dissent. I'm not yet ready to circulate to the court. But it's getting on into June, and I want to give you as much time as I can to answer it. So I took his dissent with me. I was going to a circuit judicial conference. It absolutely ruined my weekend when I read it. <laughs> But I was so glad to have the extra few days to come up with responses. There's one line in your piece, in your brief, that I thought was part of a conversation with him, subtle or not so subtle, that I love, but I might be over-reading it, in which you are pointing out that if some women, any women, desire the kind of education VMI offers, that's enough yeah. to, to justify equal protection. And you also then go on to make the point, some men would not want yeah. to undergo this sort of adversative training. And in parentheses, you say, our dissenter among them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> That makes me want to ask you more, as I know a lot of students have asked in these polarized times, how did you sustain such uh, a friendship of the sort you had with Justice Scalia, despite the very s strong disagreements? And what advice do you have for our young people um, about the importance of friendship for democratic institutions and how to build them uh, despite differing opinions. Uh, what endeared Justice Scalia to me most of all was his wonderful sense of humor. Yeah. He was a very funny man. And when there were three of us, uh, when he was on the Court of Appeals with me, just three judges, not nine, uh, he would sometimes whisper something that cracked me up, and I had all I could do to avoid bursting out into hysterical <laughs> laughter. I can't tell you some of the notes that I received <laughs> over, over the years. Not even one? And, then, no. <laughs> and, and although our writing styles were very different, we both really cared about good writing. Yeah. Um, um, about, we worked hard on our opinions so that they would be comprehensible, at least to other judges and lawyers. And at the optimum, a wider, a wider public. We shared a passion for opera. Mm -hmm. So we were supernumeraries, extras, in two of the Washington National Opera production. And there is opera about the two of us. It is, of course, a comic opera, Scalia Ginsburg. And by the way, my feminist friend sometimes asks me, why did you allow his name to go before yours? <laughs> Mine is first alphabetically. Because seniority really matters in our workplace. Everything is done 
by seniority, and he was appointed to the court several years before I was. The, the, the comic opera tries to set up the difference between the two of us, and I'll just give you the gist of it. Early in the opera, Scalia sings a rage aria. And the rage aria is, the justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. And then I answer in my coloratura soprano voice, <laughs> um, Dear Justice Scalia, you are searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that like our society, it can evolve. So that sets up the difference between us. The plot is roughly based on the magic flute. Justice Scalia is locked in a dark room being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> and then I enter through a glass ceiling <laughs> to help him pass the tests he needs to pass to get out of the dark room. A character left over from Don Giovanni, the commentatore he's called, is astonished. He said, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And then we sing a wonderful duet that says, we are different, we are one. Different in our approach to reading a legal text, but one in our reverence for the institution we serve and for the Constitution of the United States. Is this anecdote true about him that President Clinton asked him right before he nominated you to the Supreme Court, asked Scalia, which would you rather have, Mario Cuomo or Lawrence Tribe? Yes. And Scalia said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> it, it was a reporter, and that was yeah. not Clinton himself, but that was the choice he was given, Cuomo, uh, Professor Tribe, and he picked me. Yeah. <laughs> what about that? that moment. Could you talk about that a little bit, what it was like to be nominated to oh. the Supreme Court? I, I was in Vermont attending a wedding when I get a call from the White House counsel. Come back immediately. The president wants to meet you. And I said, I traveled all this way to attend a wedding. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll take the first plane back in the morning. And they said, fine, uh, will you go right from the plane to the White House? And I said, but I'll probably be wearing my travel clothes. That's all right, the president will be coming in off the golf course. <laughs> well, I show up in my travel clothes. President Clinton is not coming from the golf course, he's coming from church services. So he's dressed in his Sunday best. That's how it started out. <laughs> but we had a great conversation. In his days in Arkansas, um, President Clinton had been an adjunct member of the law faculty, the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. So he wanted to talk about hmm. constitutional law, which we did. But then I wasn't called until quite late in the evening. And when he called me, I was on cloud nine. It was just joy beyond reckoning. But then he said, and tomorrow morning we will have a ceremony in the Rose Garden and we'd like you to make some remarks. 
So I had to descend from the cloud, <laughs> sit down at my desk, and write the remarks that I made and that are in, in that in book. In the book I, I have, yeah. And it's a very moving set of remarks. I'm thinking in particular of what you said about your own mother. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. Well, I don't remember if I said this in those remarks, but I've often said, what's the difference between a bookkeeper in New York's garment district, which my mother was, and a Supreme Court justice? The difference is one generation. The difference between the opportunities eventually open to me and the much more restrictive opportunities available to my mother. We have a, a cluster of first year seminars here that focus on the topic of progress, question mark. I wonder, given what you've just said about the difference between your mother, the opportunities available to her, and those available to you, where do we stand right now with respect to um, rights? Uh, are, we, can, are we still on a path that you define as progress or, or not? Well, we certainly have made huge strides, but there's no doubt also that we have not reached nirvana. And there is still rampant discrimination on the basis of race, gender, It's true that most of the explicit classifications, men are treated this way, women that way, are gone from the law books. But what remains is what has been called unconscious bias. And one excellent example of that is the symphony orchestra. In my growing up years, I never saw a woman in a symphony orchestra, except perhaps a harp player. Mm. Howard Taubman, who was a very able critic, music critic, critic for the New York Times, said, blindfold me, and I can tell you if it's a woman playing the piano or a man. Same for the violin. Someone decided to put him to the test. <laughs> it was all mixed up. <laughs> and then, someone got the even brighter idea, let's drop a curtain between the people who are auditioning for membership in the orchestra and the judges. So they won't know, they won't see a woman's face or a, a man's face. When I was telling this story at a music festival some years ago, a violinist said to me, you left out something. Well, what did I leave out? You left out that we auditioned shoeless. So they won't hear a woman's heels coming on the stage. But that simple device, the drop curtain, led to an almost overnight change hmm. in the composition of symphony orchestras. Unfortunately, we can't duplicate the drop curtain in every field of human endeavor. Mm -hmm. and another good example of the un unconscious bias operating was the Title VII case from, it was from the late 70s. Women were complaining that they were not being promoted to middle management jobs at AT&T. And it, a comparison showed that on every measure up to the very last one, the women scored as well as the men, at least as well as the men. But at the last step, which was called the total person test, women dropped out disproportionately. What was the total person test? An interviewer is having a conversation with the candidate for promotion. 
women drop out disproportionately. Hmm. Unconscious bias, because the interviewer is not aware that he has a certain comfort level when he's dealing with a person who's the same color, the same gender, but he's a little uneasy if he's dealing with someone from another race, a different gender. He doesn't quite know how this person thinks. And that shows up in, his discomfort shows up in, in the lower score. Mm -hmm. um, on, So how do, you, how do you overcome this unconscious bias? There was a decision about oh, many years ago by the European Court of Justice, which is the highest court for the EU. And the question was, in a particular province in Germany, for a civil service job in a field that had once been dominated by men. Could there be a preference for women? The, the system was, if there are two people more or less equally qualified to do the job, pick the women because the women have been screened out in the past. When the European Court of Justice wrote that decision, you could see between the lines what they were saying. We're not so sure that this is a preference for women. This may be just overcoming the unconscious bias that exists uh, among the male decision makers. Mm. Interesting. I wish I could ask you about affirmative action now, but I will not. I will be restrained. I do have a, another question for you, though, and it has to do with your approach to um, creating the pathway to the eventual uh, form of equality that we have, scope of, of equality that we have. It reminded me a little bit, by the way, of the work of one of our graduates, Charles Hamilton Houston, mm -hmm. who helped lay the groundwork for what Thurgood Marshall eventually achieved with Brown v. Board. Um, the question I have has to do with the, the distinction that you make between Brown v. Board and Roe v. Wade when it comes to the question of whether the court should get, could, ought to get out ahead of political processes and legislative processes. And you make that distinction saying that in the case of Brown v. Board, getting out ahead made sense. In general, however, you prefer a, a different process over time. But it wasn't really getting out ahead in Brown v. Board. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was insistent on building blocks. So Brown v. Board was not the first case of unequal right. educational facilities. He, he had the building blocks in place. One case sweat against Painter when the state of Texas finally realized that it could not exclude African Americans from legal education, set up a separate school that was vastly inferior in every way. And then there were other schools, other states that would pay the tuition for an African American to go to some other state. Mm -hmm or isolate the student in a corner of a room. All those building blocks were in place. You mentioned the Holocaust before. There's also a connection there. The United States government filed a brief in Brown v. Board in which it said, essentially, we have fought a war against odious racism. And the attempt to annihilate all the Jews in Europe. 
And yet, until the very end of World War II, our own troops were rigidly separated by race. Mm -hmm. And now, the then Soviet Union is holding up the United States as a negative example all over the world, saying, essentially, there is apartheid in America. Please, Supreme Court, take that uh, instrument away from the Soviet Union and realize the principle that was established in, in, in the Holocaust, that odious discrimination on the basis of a racial identity is not compatible with any constitution that provides for the equal protection of the laws. The problem that I addressed in Roe was not with the decision. The decision in my mind was absolutely right mm -hmm. because it was the most extreme, Texas had the most extreme law in the nation. A woman could not get an abortion unless it was necessary to save her life. Didn't matter if she had been raped, if the pregnancy was the result of incest, um, if her health would be disastrously affected. None of that mattered, only one reason, the life of the woman was at stake. That was too extreme, and all the court had to do was to say, that most extreme law is unconstitutional, period. Instead, the court's decision in Roe v. Wade, which by the way wasn't controversial at the time, it was 72, mm -hmm. um, the court made every restrictive abortion law in the country, even in the most liberal states, unconstitutional in one fell swoop. And that gave the right to life partisans a single target to aim at. Instead of having to fight in the trenches, state legislature by state legislature, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, there was a single target, the unelected nine justices deciding this question for the, once and for all, for the entire nation. Um, I think the development might have been different if the court took the approach that it took in Brown, that is, have the building box in place, take the Texas most extreme law, then the next law, and the next law. So people see that history differently, but that, that the decision has become a symbol in the political arena to charge the court with taking away from the people the right to decide this um, controversial issue. So who knows what would have been if the court had been more modest, just struck down the Texas law, and then let the, the law evolve from, from there. Thank you for clarifying those views. There are other people who want to ask questions, and I have a list of them. Before uh, we turn to the questioners, the last thing I'd like to give you an opportunity to say a little about, because people are so fascinated and, and inspired by it, is your relationship with your husband, Marty, whom you met at Cornell, I believe, yeah. and uh, with whom you had, a, a, at the time, very unusual relationship, which you've said 
was a big part of your ability to do the work you've done on all of our behalves. I've said many times that Marty was the first boy I ever dated that cared that I had a brain. He was so secure in himself that he would never regard me as any kind of a threat or a competitor. Instead, he was my biggest booster. I suppose he figured that if he wanted to spend his life with me, I had to be somebody special. And he, he was a, a great cook. When he died, the Supreme Court spouses, as a tribute to him, took uh, some of his recipes. He had uh, over 150 on a disc. They took some 30 odd of them and put them in a book called Supreme Chef, and Marty is the supreme That's great. chef. He did, in fact, cater. The, the, the spouses met quarterly for lunch in what was once called the ladies' dining room. But it got to be a little embarrassing when there was John O'Connor and Martin Ginsburg <laughs> who were not ladies. So Sandra and I went to the old chief, Chief Justice Rehnquist, with an offer he couldn't turn down. The Supreme Court has many traditions and they're not easy to depart from. But this one was, because we said, let's call it, instead of the ladies' dining room, the Natalie Cornell Rehnquist dining room. And it was the chief's <laughs> wife who had died of cancer. And so he found that totally acceptable. <laughs> and we, so they, they met quarterly there, and Marty was always the number one pick to be co-caterer because his, he was so skilled. And it came about because our original arrangement when our children were young, I was the everyday cook, he was the weekend and company cook. When my daughter got into her teens, about 15 years old, she noticed an enormous difference between daddy's cooking and mommy's. <laughs> and said, why should daddy just be the weekend and company cook? He should be the everyday cook as well. And for me, it was like Tom Sawyer and the fence. Um, in fact, we moved to Washington, D.C. in 1980, and from that year to this, I have not cooked a meal. <laughs> when my husband died, my daughter felt responsible for my proper nourishment. So she comes, as she will come this Saturday, once a month. She cooks for me. She fills the freezer with individual meals that will last me until she comes back next. Your daughter, who's professor at Columbia yes. University. Yeah. <laughs> A tip for all the faculty out there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. By the way, one last comment. You, in your writings and speeches, you stress so heavily the importance of collegiality to the preservation of strong institutions. And I simply want to thank you for that. I, I find it an inspiration. And I recommend that everyone read what Justice Ginsburg has had to say about the value of collegiality, even in the face of extraordinary differences in approach to keep democracy alive. Thank you for that. Our first questioner from the audience is Bridget Carmichael, class of 21. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Um, so my question is, if you had to choose another career in life other than lawyer, judge, or Supreme Court justice, what would you be and why? I would be a great diva. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
I might have been Jesse Norman, who sadly died recently, or Renata Tabaldi, or Maria Callas. But sad for me, I'm a monotone. <laughs> so a diva career was not, was not an option. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Bridget. Thank you. James Minor. Hi, James. Class of 23, so you're a new student. Yes, I am. Welcome. Um, uh, hello, Your Honor. Um, you mentioned earlier in your conversation a lot about um, the differences and the progress you've made with Title VII, a lot of opportunities that are open to you that weren't open to your mother. But you yourself have actually presided over a lot of cases that have opened doors to a lot of different Americans, you know, millions of different Americans. So my question to you is, of the cases that have been decided during your time on the bench, which case do you believe has had the largest impact, positive or negative, on America? Um, well, read my dissenting opinions. <laughs> so uh, negative impact, the Shelby County case that held unconstitutional a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. The most recent the decision last term in the gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering case, mm -hmm. I thought and agreed with Justice Kagan, who wrote the dissent, that it was an abdication of the court's responsibility. And then partisan gerrymandering is corrosive of our democracy. So that, those are two. There are others. Citizens United, the inability to control campaign spending. Mm. I, I mentioned those more than Bush v. Gore because Bush v. Gore was a, was a one time thing. It has had no precedential value at all. But these others do have precedential value. Mm. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, James. Gabriel Acharte. Gabriel. Hi. Ah, hi. Gabe, hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm so focused. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming to our school, Justice Ginsburg. We're all very big fans of yours. Um, what do you make of the current global phenomenon of nations trying to far-right parties and increasingly illiberal styles of government? And how do you see this phenomenon affecting the United States and the resilience of our institutions? Um, Sorry. <laughs> how do I see the, the development of the... Populism? Um, just the global turn to more illiberal styles of government. More illiberal styles of government. And, and far-right populism, too. Yeah, we can, we can do them all. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just didn't hear the right word. I wasn't giving you a substitute. No. Well, if we could take it to the level of our own country, there's a great man who once said that the true symbol of the United States is not the bald eagle. It is the pendulum. The pendulum goes too far to the right. It's going to swing back. The same thing, too far to, to the left. So I'm hoping to see the swing back in my, in my lifetime. There have been some hopeful signs, too, about democracy. Think of the recent decision by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom that told the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, that he could not simply disband the Parliament and get away with it. Thank you. So you feel hopeful? Yeah, over the long haul, yes. Over the long haul, yes. <laughs> Joe Flukager. Hi, Joe. Joe is head of our dining services. I'm not going to ask about food, though. <laughs> I promise. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, you have lived through some extremely challenging times. Um, this period right now is no exception. How do you think people will characterize this period in American history? As an aberration. Mm. Thank you.
Hunter Hughes. Hi, Justice. Just want to say thank you for making the trip up north to see us. My question for you today is, what is the court case you're most proud to have heard and cast your vote on? That you're most proud of? That, yeah. So that question is like asking which of my four grandchildren, one great-grandchild, two step-grandchildren, <laughs> is my favorite. <laughs> I couldn't, and I've been on the Supreme Court now for over 26 years. So I couldn't pick out one case. I do have some favorites. The VMI case is one. Uh, on the dissent side, Lily Ledbetter's case is another. Uh, my dissent in the Shelby County Voting Rights Act case is another. Perhaps I should describe that and for people not familiar with it, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. Overwhelming majorities among Republicans and Democrats. It was periodically reviewed, renewed, periodically renewed, also with large majorities. The way it worked was that if a state or a county or a city had kept African Americans from voting in the bad old days, that jurisdiction couldn't make any change in its voting legislation unless it pre-cleared the change with the Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division, or a three specially constituted three judges district court in the District of Columbia. That check, the pre-clearance check, kept a lot of what might have been discriminatory laws off the books. But the court said it's now 2000 whatever, Voting Rights Act, 1965. There are many jurisdictions that were discriminators in the bad old days that aren't anymore. So Congress can't simply renew that list of discriminators. It has to do it over to see who's discriminating today. I regarded that as a highly impractical view because what legislator will stand up in Congress or the Senate and say, oh, my jurisdiction is still discriminating against African Americans. Please keep us on the bad list. <laughs> Just wasn't going to happen. The formula wasn't going to change. That didn't mean that a state had no escape because the Voting Rights Act itself had a bailout provision. That is, if the state, county, city had towed the line for X number of years, it could bail out of the preclearance requirement. So I thought Congress had itself provided a formula for exiting from the preclearance. Pre and that's, it was a case in which I used the expression, the, the courts tossing out the, uh, the formula used in the Voting Rights Act is like tossing out your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Olivia Geiger. Hi. Thank you so much for being here, Justice Ginsburg. My question is, what role do you think that the courts have in addressing our climate crisis? And what role does the court have in addressing our climate crisis? First, I should make clear that the court, unlike the administration, unlike the legislature, is a totally reactive institution. We don't create the controversies that come before us. We don't decide 
this year we're going to clean up uh, laws restricting free speech. We react, we're a reactive institution. We react to petitions for review that are filed before us. So unless there's a complaint that's gone through the court system, we will never hear the question. So we, we will react in an environmental case when there are challenges. Sometimes it's environmentalists saying the government is too lax in this regulation. Sometimes it's industrialists saying the government is too heavy handed in what it is requiring us to do. But that's how the court gets to hear a controversy. It depends on the people who care about an issue bringing the case in the, the court. Thank you. Sarah Montoya. Lately, it feels that you have become less of a person who happens to be a judge and more of a symbol of liberalism in America today, distinct from the usual symbolism of the impartial roped judge. There's been movies made about you, skits on SNL, and there's even RBG merchandise that people wear on this campus. Do you feel that the expectation to be a hero figure is a burden or is it necessary for the work that you do? It's a amazing phenomenon. And it was all created by a student, a second year student at NYU Law School, who read the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County case, the Voting Rights Act case that I just mentioned, and was angry. She thought the court had done the wrong thing. And then she thought more and appreciated that anger was not going to get her any place. She should do something positive. So she took my dissent in the Shelby County case and created this blog, which then took out into the wild blue yonder. <laughs> but it's, people ask me, Weren't you surprised that the name this student chose for you, Notorious RBG, was the name of a famous rapper, the Notorious B.I.G.? And I said, I wasn't at all surprised. <laughs> because the two of us had something very important in common, that is, we were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Laura Gottesfeld, you doing OK still? A few more? Yes. OK. Thank you so much for coming today. My question is, which case did the court spend the most time deliberating on in the court's most recent session? And what aspects of the case made it the most time consuming or complex? The, I can't say that the court at, at its conferences deliberates uh, long about the, the cases. Usually we go around the table, each justice expresses his or her view, and then there'll be some cross conversation, but not too much. At some point, the chief or another justice will say, enough talk, it will all come out in the writing. So it's, it's not so much the oral exchange of views, as our effort to explain how we got from here to there. You know, the judges are obliged to give reasons for what they do. The executive doesn't have to give reasons, the Congress doesn't have to give reasons, but we have to justify in writing our positions. And that discipline of writing it 
out. Uh, it's it's a it's a key discipline that we and we're we're trying all the time to persuade our colleagues. As I said, more often we hope we can do it in our writing. So every time I'm writing a dissent for fall, I'm hopeful that my dissent will be so persuasive and I'll pick up another vote. And most of the time that hope is disappointed. <laughs> but one time, just to give you an example, I was assigned by my senior colleague to write a dissent in a criminal case just for the two of us. So the lineup was seven to two. In the fullness of time, the decision came down six to three, but the two had swelled to six, and the seven had shrunk to three. So as a famous man once said, it ain't over until it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wonderful. David Schneider, Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Music. It, it, it wasn't planned this way, but I think that my question follows nicely on the former one. Given that you are well versed in the central issues in cases brought before the court in advance of oral argument, how often do attorneys appearing before the court sway your opinion by shedding light on aspects of the case that have not already occurred to you? Not often. <laughs> Indeed. When, it, when a justice prepares for the oral argument session, she will have first read the opinions in the trial court, the, in the Court of Appeals, so she knows what other good minds in the judiciary think about the question. Then she'll turn to the lawyer's briefs, including the umpteen friend of the court briefs that get filed, the relevant precedent, perhaps slow review, commentary. So it's, no one enters the oral argument with an empty mind. But no one should enter either with a closed mind. There's always some room to be affected by the oral argument. Now, sometimes there'll be a big issue, substantive issue, and the oral argument will reveal that there's a procedural obstacle to reaching that issue. Sometimes counsel will bring that out, will bring out the procedural hindrance. I did see once in the 26 years a, a case where the court turned around 180 degrees on the basis of an oral argument. And it was a capital case It was one on the basis of the facts. The lawyer was so excellent that he presented a picture of the facts that led the majority of the court to believe that the defendant wasn't the one who did the dastardly deed. It was Beanie who, who did it. But that was a remarkable feat. It wasn't on the basis of the law, just on the basis of the fact record that that lawyer was able to persuade the Supreme Court that the lower court missed the boat. And it, still, it's important to have an oral argument session. It's kind of a last clear chance that the lawyer has to try to influence the minds of the people who will decide the case. Thank you very much. You had some influence in your arguments. Mm -hmm. You had some influence in your oral arguments. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I Alyssa, hope so. Alyssa, and, go ahead. You know, and including, I think it was, yes, in Frontier, I quoted 
Sarah Grimke, who said, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Yeah, beautiful. That, that got a lot of attention. That, <laughs> yes, that I like even better than the umbrella, but it, they're both great. Yes, Alyssa Foreman, class of 22. Hi, Justice Ginsburg. I just want to say that I adore you and you're my inspiration, so thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> How would you say that your experiences as the daughter of two Jewish immigrants and as a first-generation college student on scholarship and other forms of financial assistance have informed your role as a Supreme Court justice? Uh, one thing, my, my father came to the United States from what is today Ukraine in, when he was 13. My mother was the first person in her large family born and bred in the USA. So her mother... Um, arrived in New York four months before my mother's birth. She was conceived in the old country, born in, in the new country. And what was the... the um, and what how, impact? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, how has that background like of your Jewish heritage and also being a first-generation college student, how have those things informed your role as a Supreme Court justice? Well, one of the things that my mother instilled in me was a love of learning. Uh, even though she had no college education, she was bound and determined to see that, that I did have a good education. In, in those ancient days, it was in her large family, the eldest son went to Cornell University. But the others, uh, the boys as well as the girls, did not have that opportunity. It was reserved for the, for the eldest son. I, I, I'm very proud of my Jewish heritage. Um, You know, there's this, a saying in, in Hebrew, Zedek, Zedek, teared off, it's justice, justice, shall you pursue, pursue that you may thrive. So a judge can thrive only if she pursues justice. Thank you so much. Mm. Danielle King. Hi. Um, my question is, how should justices in the United States utilize international law when debating and deciding cases? Well, I should make a distinction between foreign law and international law. International law is the law that governs conduct between nations. So international law is undoubtedly part of our law as it is part of the law of every nation in the world. There has been some question about the utility of citing foreign law, that is, um, take a question that has uh, come up in different legal systems and look to see how another system would answer that question. So the latter, foreign law, is not part of our law. But we can look to what our counterpart courts in other places in the world, we can look to their decisions for enlightenment, the same way I could read a professor's commentary on an issue, why not refer to a brilliant judgment of another, of another court. But foreign law is definitely not our law. It is, it is a source. It is one of many sources. 
that may give us some enlightenment uh, on an issue. So, for example, um, in the line of cases leading up to the gay marriage decision, Justice Kennedy had looked at how these questions were being treated in other nations. Not because it was in any sense binding on us, but to see that others committed to democratic principles had wrestled with this hard question. Thank you. Morgan Urosik. Hi. Justice, thank you so much for spending some time with our community today. As our senior class prepares to embark on our careers, I'm curious to know what was the most valuable or impactful piece of constructive feedback you received during the early years of your career? The most constructive feedback? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say the most constructive advice that I received came from my mother-in-law on my wedding day when she said, she would tell me the secret of a happy marriage. I'd love to know, what is it? Every now and then it helps to be a little deaf. <laughs> that is, if, it, if an unkind or thoughtless word is said, you just tune out. It's just as though you didn't hear it. And then some very good advice I had from my father-in-law. Um, I had two years between graduating from college and starting law school. And in that period, my first child was born. And I was concerned about how I could manage the rigors of the Harvard Law School with an infant. And my father-in-law said to me, Ruth, if you decide not to go to law school, no one will think the less of you. It's an entirely legitimate choice. But if you really want to be a lawyer, you will stop worrying over this question. You will pull yourself together and find a way. So that's a question I've asked at every important turning point in my life. Do I want this enough? And if the answer is yes, then I go for it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Beth Olson, one of our Amherst Fund coordinators. Hi, Beth. Hi. Uh, Amherst is a community that prides itself on excellence, which often creates a culture of perfectionism. Do you have any advice that might help us to be more humble in forgiving our mistakes and shortcomings, both of ourselves and of others? Well, to err is human. <laughs> so and it's been said that, what is it, the, what is the expression? Um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. So, what was... <laughs> you gave some good advice yeah. with that comment. Um, the question was, how would you advise people here to be a little more forgiving and... Yeah, um, well one thing is to listen. Because listening seems to be uh, less prevalent today than it once was. And one of my dear uh, colleagues on the Supreme Court, Justice John Paul Stevens, talked about learning through listening, listening to people with different points of view, trying to understand those different points of view, which may lead to strengthening your opposing views, but that, that idea of learning through listening, listening to people who have different points of views, 
recognizing that there may be some merit to what they're saying and thinking of arguments that will shore up your position. So that's what I would advise, more listening and less talking. Thank you so much. <laughs> Catherine Sanderson, Maxwell Family Professor in Life Sciences. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a turbulent few years in America. What words of hope can you give us about the role of the Supreme Court in helping to ease this turbulence? Well, as I already commented, the Supreme Court doesn't have an agenda of its own. It doesn't decide that we're going to take care of this area or that area. It is a totally reactive institution. It depends upon people bringing cases before us that will present the issue. Uh, a very wise Court of Appeals judge said, the courts don't make the conflict conflagrations, but they do their best to put them out. So it's important to understand the role of the court, unlike the legislature, is we don't have an agenda. We react to what's out there, questions that are brought to us. Thank you. Was it, was it hard for you to switch from being an advocate to being a justice? I think I'm still an advocate. I think so too, yeah. <laughs> in, in, when I write a dissent, as I said before, I'm always hopeful that a, my advocacy will persuade, I mean, it's a smaller audience, there's only nine of us, but. But you have what you call your sisters there now. I have, yes, justice is, so to my Aaron Kagan? Yeah. Yeah, it, it really has changed the institution. Because when, the worst time was when I was all alone. Justice O'Connor retired, and there I was, the lone woman. The public saw eight rather well-fed men emerge <laughs> on the bench, and then this small woman. It, but now, um, because I've been there so long, I, I sit next to the chief. Sotomayor is on one side, Kagan on the other side. My sisters-in-law are not shrinking violets. They are very active in the colloquy that goes on at argument sessions. When Justice O'Connor and I overlapped, invariably one lawyer or another would call me Justice O'Connor <laughs> because they knew there was a woman on the Supreme Court and her name was Justice O'Connor. Even though we didn't speak alike, we didn't look alike. But now, nowadays, no one calls me Justice Sotomayor or Justice Kagan and nobody calls them Justice Ginsburg, so that's progress. Just as we end, let me ask you this. Will there ever be an Equal Rights Amendment? And is it I, I hope so. Yeah, I thought you might hope so. And the, re the reason I hope so is when I take out this pocket constitution, which I take with me wherever I am in the world, I would like to be able to say to my granddaughters, the equal citizenship stature of men and women is as basic to our society as free speech, for example. So I can point to the First Amendment. Um, but the Equal Protection Clause that became part of the Constitution in 1868, if you ask the framers of that amendment, did that guarantee equal treatment of women, they would say, of course not. Many states, in many states, women can't, women, once they marry, can't 
own property in their own name, can't sue and be sued in their own name, can't contract in, the, in their own name. All those married women disabilities, the framers of the 14th Amendment did not intend to change. But yet, the, the basic idea of equality does have growth potential. So things that were not understood um, as violations of equal protection in 1868 are so recognized today. But because the 14th Amendment was not designed to do anything about the equal treatment of men and women. It would be, to me, very desirable to state that premise just the way we state freedom of speech, religion, as one of the fundamental tenets of our democracy. So even if you can urge that we've come under the Equal Protection Clause about as far as we might under an Equal Rights Amendment, so it's largely symbolic. Even if that's true, it's a very important symbol. Every constitution in the world written since the year 1950 has the equivalent of an Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time for us to catch up. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, it's such a pleasure to sit here with someone so accomplished, so guided by principle, so devoted to truth-seeking, so steady, so consistent. It's a boon in the midst of what we're experiencing in the world, and I couldn't thank you enough. Before I thank you and allow the audience to thank you, I just want to take a minute to thank the many staff at Amherst College who have made it possible for us to have the event in this gym in Coolidge Cage. It was a lot of work uh, and on the parts of many, uh, perhaps more than any other, Austin Hewitt and his events team. And I know that everyone is glad, I certainly am, that so many more of us could attend than could have attended otherwise. So a big round of applause for our staff. And a special note about the creativity of our students. The first time I actually thought of asking our staff about Coolidge Cage came when I got an email from one of our undergraduate students. Well, we're all undergraduates. You are all undergraduates. Hunter Lamson, who was seated by my, by my partner here in the front row, who wrote to me and said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is someone that many in the community, all who wish, should be able to hear. You cited a president of the United States who spoke in the cage many years ago. I can't remember which one. But in any case, thanks to Hunter Lampson and all of our creative students who write to me and tell me the right thing to do. I appreciate it. <laughs> Everything we know about Justice Ginsburg tells us how generous she is. But I must also tell you, she arrived here this afternoon, uh, did an hour, over an hour long seminar with students about last session's cases, answered many questions at length in the most informative way, 
and has done that again tonight. This is such a privilege, and uh, your generosity seems to know no bounds. Similarly, your energy. Um, let us rise and thank Justice Ruth Bader. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going out this way.